Welcome to the next episode of Seeking Voices of Health, Healing, and Hope. I'm your host, Dr. Monica Agarwal. As many of you know, I'm a preventive cardiologist, a researcher, a mom, a wife, an athlete, and I'm also a patient. Over the years, after getting sick myself and taking care of so many people, I've heard so many voices of sadness and of fear, so much struggle. I decided to do this podcast to bring out those voices, voices of struggle, but also of overcoming, of hope, of redemption, and of the power. Thank you for tuning in. My next guest is Chuck Carroll. Chuck is a great person. I've had the pleasure of meeting Chuck when I did the exam room podcast with him. He's the fabulous host of PCRM's The Exam Room, where he brings up medical issues, health issues, and talks all about all sorts of great things. I've had such a pleasure speaking with Chuck on this podcast multiple times. As a host, he's incredible, inquisitive, insightful, and a kind host. But what many of you might not know is that Chuck struggled with food addiction and once weighed over 300 pounds. Every person is an onion. So much of the time we just see the outside layers. It takes time to peel back the layers though and see the colors and the character inside. Everyone has a story and I look forward to you hearing uh, Chuck's story and his message of hope. Thank you, Chuck, for being here. It is my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yay, it's so fun. I, I've really been enjoying doing these podcasts because I think I was I was telling somebody, I think I'm doing this more for me than for anyone. Just, just bring, um, make myself understand that message of hope and see how people have overcome the adversities in their life. Um, so I thought I'd ask, start with asking you, you know, you know, this is something that you've talked about a little bit in other podcasts. And I just, you know, want to kind of start with maybe answering. So you're the host of this great podcast, The Exam Room. Like, tell me about that, maybe to start. What's it like? And how did you get this job? Like, how did you end up in this space? I honestly thought that I would never wind up anywhere close to doing what it is that I do today. Um, as you said, I mean, this has just been such a, a, a remarkable journey, you know, not just a weight loss journey, but life in general. And um, like, like the scale, it has its ups and its downs, but I'm so glad that I was able to take a career that began really as someone wanting to be the next Howard Stern, you know, a shock jock back in the day and evolved over time into sports media covering the NFL and then into regular news, uh, working for both CBS and later NBC. And then using my own story and becoming so impassioned by the transformation that I experienced and wanting to help others experience the same kind of transition, uh, I pitched the idea of doing the show, taking my media expertise over to the physician's committee and hosting the exam room. And it has just exploded beyond my wildest expectations to become one of the most downloaded nutrition and health focused podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And so I get to talk to experts like you and uh, obviously Dr. Neil Barnard, but to me, the shows that I love most, it's not talking to Dr. Monica Agarwal, it's talking to Monica who was a patient herself and has taken just this dire circumstance and completely flip it on its head and brought hope not just to her life, but by sharing her story to so many other millions of people. And so that's what I love is just bringing that hope and that inspiration and that fact that it can be done out into the world. It's beautiful. I mean, I think that's so true. And it's the connection that I've really enjoyed from this podcast. And I think that's what you're referring to is that connection to people you know, I, th I think that, um, you know, COVID's been nasty, horrible, the loneliness, the psychology, you know, there's so many studies now coming out about kids and adults um, who are struggling with uh, mental illness and depression uh, that has certainly been exacerbated by COVID. And I do think that podcasting and hearing personal stories has really uh, brought some some of that connection that people are struggling with so much. So I do commend you for what you've done at PCRM and at the exam room because I do love listening to it and I do love your guests and I and I love you on it. So thank you for that. 
So well, it's my how pleasure. would I, yeah. So what I'd love to start also asking you is, so one of the things I love to ask people is how would you describe yourself? Like, what are your superpowers? And then what are your, what are your weaknesses? Like, wh who are you? You know, what do you, how do you see yourself? That is a complicated question. <laughs> um, who am I? Um, I'm, I'm just a guy who wants to help others. You know, at my heaviest, I was 420 pounds and, you know, coming from a family where heart disease runs rampant and having a grandfather who died before I was even born and another grandfather who had so many heart attacks and, and heart procedures himself and, and now having a father who is struggling with heart health and has had a number of procedures. I'm a guy who was on the accelerated plan for that. I didn't think I was going to live to see 30 years old. Um, I'm going to turn 40 this year, which is fantastic. And I plan on seeing many, many, many more years um, from today, but I'm just a guy that really, I thought it was impossible to do. And now that I know that it's not, uh, I, I'm just trying to help other people along. And so I'm taking my natural inquisitiveness as a journalist, and I'm bringing that forward into what I feel is the perfect realm for asking questions when it comes to health and data and all of these studies, which just excite me. And so you're asking about superpowers. And what I tell people is, I'm not Superman. I'm absolutely just a regular Joe. The only difference is I have learned that I already had within me everything that I needed to make this change that I thought was completely impossible. But more importantly, what I've discovered is that every single person on the planet has the exact same ability within them. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy journey. I'm not saying it's going to be a walk in the park because God knows there were days where I felt like throwing in the towel, but it's nothing that you cannot handle. And if you just push through and you keep going, the other side and being healthy is more fantastic than you could possibly ever imagine in your wildest dreams. Okay. Well, that's, you know, that, that's so awesome. So but talk about that. So, you know, how did this all start for you? You know, were you a obese child and tell us how you grew up and, or did that, is it something, do you remember a defining moment that sort of where you, or how did it all go down? I mean, so you're talking about getting up to 420 pounds didn't happen overnight. I mean, the seeds for morbid obesity for me were planted very, very, very early in life. You know, some of my earliest memories are going to my grandma's house after school. And her idea of a well-balanced meal was a can of baked beans, maybe a can of corn and a hot dog with Lay's potato chips. And so the corn, okay, would have been healthy if it wasn't cream corn. The baked beans had pork in them, so you can throw those out. And then the potato chips, well, who's going to say a potato chip is healthy, right? But those were considered three vegetables and considered healthy by that definition by my grandma who I love to death. Um, and then the hot dog was the hot dog. She didn't see any harm in that either. But anyway, when you're eating that after school, after you've already eaten this really unhealthy school lunch, that's typically pizza and French fries, and then, you know, maybe chocolate milk, which I never really enjoyed, but would drink sometimes because peer pressure, uh, or fruit punch, which was nothing but sugar water. Um, and then you have that. And then single mother, picking us up after she finishes working, doesn't have a whole lot of time, nor does she have a whole lot of money. And so what do we do? We go to the drive-through and we load up on food there for the night. So you're going, you know, breakfast, lunch, second lunch, and then dinner. None of them were healthy. And so I just began getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time I was even in the third grade, I think I was well over 100 pounds and being mortified when I stepped on the scale at school and just telling the person who was taking the readings off of the scale that I needed to go on a diet. That was the first time in my life, in the third grade, mind you, that I decided that I needed to go on a diet. But so you problem, understood at you know nine years old, you understood that you had too much weight on your hands. So you absolutely. you understood that, but you did you understand what had created you to gain weight? No, not, not at all. I just, I thought that I had drawn the short straw compared to my friends who weren't necessarily 
sharing this struggle. You know, I was the heaviest kid in class for, for many, many years, right up basically through high school. And um, I had no idea of the consequences until I got to about, you know, my, my freshman or sophomore year in high school, when my blood pressure had gotten so out of control that they put me on beta blockers, right? So I'm on high blood pressure medication as a freshman or a sophomore in high school, for goodness sakes, we're talking about like 180 over 100 or sometimes even 195 over 100 um, readings. And it was just alarmingly high. Um, but not, that didn't even really wake me up because I was just like, okay, well, give me the pill. I'm good to go back to the drive through And so that's what I did. And, you know, my appetite grew as my waist grew and, and eventually, by the time I'm in my early 20s, I'm eating 10,000 calories a day. And unbeknownst to me at the time, was severely hooked on fast food, Taco Bell specifically. Now, what was a 10,000 calorie day? What did it look like? Well, I skipped breakfast because I thought that that was the healthy thing to do, right? One less okay. meal, that means fewer calories. So my day would really start with lunch when I would go over to Boston Market. And I would get a half of a chicken and three enormous sides. And thinking back to my childhood with the creamed corn and thinking that was healthy, of course, the creamed spinach that was one of those sides was also healthy, sure. right? Sure. So I'd get that and then a mountain of mashed potatoes and gravy, usually some cornbread to go with that. And then a diet lemonade to be healthy as well. And if I felt like I had been extra good, I would get a brownie and try to walk it off just by walking across the street after lunch. So after eating that, which I thought was healthy at the time, I would leave uh, after work and then go to 7-Eleven and I would get a snack for the drive home. And if you've ever been into a 7-Eleven, you know, right next to the hot dog rollers, they have these things called taquitos. And I would get six of the buffalo chicken taquitos and two big bottles of Gatorade. And that was my drive home. When I would get home, it was time for dinner and it was pizza time. And we used to get these flyers in the mail that were clearly targeting businesses, but for whatever reason, they hit my mailbox and it was like, buy three pizzas, get a fourth free or buy four and get a fifth free. And I'm thinking, okay, I hit the lottery. Let me go ahead and do that. So I would eat a pizza and a half, sometimes two full pizzas. And that was my dinner. But then there was some variation with all of that food that I had just mentioned, but what there was never variation from was Taco Bell every single night without fail for fourth meal, I would go to Taco Bell. And it was always, always, always the same order. It got so bad that the people at the drive through would see my car pulling into the parking lot. And before I could even get to the menu board, they would say, hey, Chuck, $20 is your total. Please drive through. And they knew exactly what it was. You know, it was, it was about a 5,000 calorie heart attack in a sack, you know, and, and I did that so much that one time I pulled up and instead of, Hey, Chuck, $20, please pull through. I heard you eat too much. The person on the other end, the employee at Taco Bell actually said that to me. And that was a moment that I had been dreading because I suspected that at some point it would come and sure enough it did, but I had a story at the ready working a night shift. I was picking up a bunch of food for the people in the office and we just always had the same order. They knew I was full of it. I knew I was full of it, but I was trying everything I could just to get out of the sticky situation. And I became so embarrassed that I didn't stop going to Taco Bell, but I stopped going to that particular mm. Taco Bell. And I started driving another extra mile, mile and a half down the road to hit another one, just so I could continue fueling my addiction without embarrassment. You know, it's interesting, you know, I wonder about that, you know, so you appreciate that you're gaining weight, you know, that people are telling you now that you're eating too much, you know, you're, there's all these stigmas, I'm sure of people at school. I mean, how was, how was that? What does it feel like 
to be told that you're obviously it feels lousy to be told that you're fat or that you're overweight or you eat too much, you know, how did you deal with that? So, you know, did you ha- always have stories sort of planned on why you, or what, what goes through your head when you feel that way? You know, I, I've read Roxanne Gay's book, um, Hunger, um, and um, I think it's called Hunger. And it's, um, she talks a lot about sort of what it feels like to be obese and what the stigmas are around it, like being in the airplane and the looks that you get. I mean, speak to that a little or being in the high, in high hmm. school, like what it must feel like. Cause high, kids aren't nice, you know? And what was that? What did that feel like? So high school had its moments. Um, but I will say that kids had it a lot worse than I did. I just kind of bought into it and started to play this larger than life persona. You know, Chris Farley, the actor was really big at the time. And so I just kind of uh, tried my best to imitate him and to have everybody like me. Comedian. Very much so. And doing the most outrageous stuff. Um, And so I I didn't really feel like I was fat shamed all that much. Um, You know, I was called heavy C you know, things like that. Um, but I just kind of bought into it. And so that wasn't that bad, but I, I carried that with me into my professional career, the early days when I was working at radio station, big 100.3 WBIG, I cannot make this up in Washington, DC. That's kind of where I got my start on air and radio. And I was big Chuck from big 100.3. So then I would tell myself that not only could I not lose weight, it would be detrimental to my career if I did. And so I used that as an excuse to continue down this unhealthy road. And when you are put in the public eye like that, that is when some pretty mean jabs can come out from listeners when you're doing public events. Um, I remember one time in particular doing uh, the Polar Plunge, raising money for the Maryland Special Olympics. And this is a freezing winter day in January. And going out there and they dressed me up in a grass skirt and a coconut bra. And um, I remember when I was introduced and I was going out there to take the dip, you know, somebody saying, there he is, the elephantine voyager, you know. And so when the person who's emceeing the event is saying that, that kind of gives permission to the rest of the crowd, like hundreds of people were there to then, you know, kind of laugh at my expense. And so that sucked. But I kind of just bought into it again, just swallowed it, took my dip, drank a couple beers and and tried to go on about my day. And and so that was kind of my medicine. Food kind of comforted me, but then giving myself these little excuses as to why I needed to be that way to pursue my dream of being on air. It was just all part of it, you know, and and that was just my plight in life. And, And so, yeah, there were uncomfortable stares on some flights and things like that, one of which we can talk about completely was one of the major catalysts for getting me to change, but I really did my best to just be that guy that people expected me to be. And so it took a little bit of the sting away. Um, But yeah, there were a handful of other instances, man, that they can be heartbreaking. Yeah. So, you know, tell, what do you mean by the catalyst in the airplane? Do you want to share that or? Yeah, you know, so this was a flight that I had been dreading, and I had not flown since I was a little kid. I was flying across country for work, and I, you know, had the date circled on my calendar, and I was just praying that I would be able to fit into the seat, and by this point, I'm close to my heaviest weight, and I know that the seats are notoriously small, and I'm thinking, man... Ooh, if I was a betting man, I'm not betting on, on myself this day. So you were, you were worried. You wouldn't even like you were preparing before you even got on the airplane. You're thinking, Oh my God, how am I going to sit in this airplane seat? I'm not going to fit. Oh, it's going to be a show. Absolutely. And it was worse than I could possibly have imagined. And so kind of like, I'm getting all nervous and anxious about this because I I just wanted this to fit. I didn't want to be embarrassed. And so I'm praying and I'm just hoping against hope that this would work out. But what I wasn't counting on was that I wasn't the only one praying that day. When I boarded that plane and I made that right-hand turn to go up the aisle to my seat, everybody else, it seemed to me, stopped dead in their tracks what they were doing. 
stop putting their suitcases in the overhead bin, stop fiddling with their laptops or cell phones, whatever. And they stared at me and then they started to pray. And they said, dear God, please don't let this fat guy sit next to me, right? Who wants to fly all the way across country sitting next to a guy that can't fit in his own seat and would be spilling over. And so they are praying and I'm looking in their eyes and it's just, it's fear. And it's just like, it must terror, feel terrible. Like, oh my God, every pair of eyes, it was like being stabbed in the heart. And so eventually, you know, I couldn't really fit down the aisle all that well. So I would have to shift with every road just to get, you know, past. And I, I purposely chose a seat in the back of the plane, hoping that I could be by myself. And so when I finally get to my seat, I sit down and I'm praying again, please let me fit into this thing. And it's not even close. And I'm trying, I'm rah, trying to get this thing to fit. And it's just not happening. And I, I mean, remember the, the seatbelt or getting into the seatbelt, the seatbelt seat at this point, you know, because I had lifted up the uh, the armrest in between the seats. It was one of those where you could do that. So that wasn't happening. And I remember lifting up my belly and trying to slide the seatbelt underneath in my belly, thinking that would shave off some inches and it wouldn't even come close. And so I had to just stand up again and shimmy down the aisles to the front of the plane, asked the flight attendant for a seatbelt extender so that we could take off. And all of those eyes then, you know, it was, they weren't praying anymore because they knew that I wasn't going to sit next to them. But, you know, it was just kind of like, they were looking at me like I was some sideshow kind of a freak, right? It was humiliating for me. And so I just kind of like slumped down in my seat when I finally got back to the to my seat for that second time with the seatbelt extender and we took off, but I will never forget the stares from everybody that day. And so that was one of the three big things that really motivated me to make some changes. Well, that's what I'm most curious about because, you know, I deal with a lot of obesity in my clinic and I, um, I've had, you know, different experiences working with different people, but I remember one in particular that I had a patient once who I told them, you know, how to, I gave them some healthy food options to eat. And they said, well, how much can I eat of that? Um, I think it was grapes or fruits. And I, and I said, they could have an unlimited amount of grapes uh, or an unlimited amount of fruit. And they came back and they, they hadn't lost any weight. And I was surprised because I, I haven't, ha I hadn't had that experience before that. And it turned out that he was eating four pounds of grapes. So he was eating so many grapes because he liked the process of consumption and just um, he liked to put things in, the, in his mouth. And what do you think about that? Like, how do you, because you knew you had, you had had multiple episodes where you felt like, oh God, I'm, I'm too fat. I need to do something about it. But what, how do you, how do you do it? Like, how do you finally what made you change and decide that I am going to lose weight or I'm going to, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit about your the decision to do um, bypass surgery or gastric bypass surgery. Like what made you do that uh, at the time that you did? And what was what you said? There were three things that happened. What were those other two things? And how do you, how would you address my comment about the patient with the four pounds of grapes? <laughs> well, let me start off with that, because that is something I can identify with. And I think that when you see somebody who is super morbidly obese, and, and maybe not even to that extent, right? Um, the, oftentimes, the first question that you get asked is going to be that very one is when can I eat this again? Or how much of this can I eat? Because you're not just talking about something as simply to this person as changing the way that they eat, right? You're literally asking them to change or make uh, or even break up with the very thing that has been the longest standing relationship in their entire life, their closest relationship. When everything else falls apart, they'll have food to fall back on. They're having a good day, they celebrate with food. They're having a bad day, they mourn with food, right? They're just having a day. Guess what? They're eating food. It has become their warm blanket, right? So you're asking somebody not to do something so simple. And so you're going to get questions like, how much of this can I eat? And when can I eat this again? And you're talking about bypass. And, and one of the questions that always gets asked in the initial consultation that I saw time and time and time again, is I would go to these things and start working with, with future patients too, was that they would always ask, well, when can I eat whatever their favorite food was again, right? So 
Um, and maybe it was cheesesteaks, maybe it was Skittles, maybe it was a Snickers bar, maybe it was Taco Bell. I don't know. It was different for everybody, but that is a true fear. You're asking them to break up with something and nobody is ever going to be able to change until and unless they are ready to break up with the way that they had been eating. It is a major overhaul. It's not a simple fix. If it were, then we wouldn't have the obesity epidemic that we do have. Now, the other two things that really kind of spurred me into a new healthier direction was another just heartbreaking episode where I was dating a girl who did not struggle with her weight. And I thought that I had hit the lottery as a, as a guy in his early twenties, being as large as I was, I thought that my options were limited if there even was one. And somehow I wound up dating this girl who was not struggling with her weight, but every single day for the year and a half that we were dating, she begged me not to tell anyone that we were a couple. She said, don't tell your friends, don't tell your family, don't tell our colleagues that we're dating, just keep it a secret. And every single day I would ask, and every single day it was the same answer. No, we're not telling anybody. And I put up with that because I thought that that was as good as I could get. And every single day I would ask, and I was told no, it was like being stabbed in the heart because the only thing I could think of why she would react this way or why she didn't want it out was because she was then ashamed to be dating somebody who was as large as I was. So mm -hmm. that kind of sucked and made me feel like I was the gum on the bottom of somebody's shoe. And then I had- But it's also... interesting because it's interesting because you, you said that maybe you thought that that was the best you could do. So almost like your own expectations for yourself were quite reduced in terms of girls or maybe in, in terms of everything, like your own expectations of what you were worth um, were as so low. Absolutely. No question about it. Like my self-confidence, my self-worth was for garbage, right? Remember, I felt like I had to be this big guy just to have a career in radio. If I wasn't this guy, I was not going to be good enough, right? So I didn't have the confidence to excel or to think that I didn't need to be this way in order to pursue my dream, right? I had zero confidence in that. But then I also was given the opportunity to be paid to lose weight while on the air, right? I was endorsing something called the cookie diet. They came to me one day and they said, Chuck, we want to help you lose weight. Would you mind endorsing something called the cookie diet? And I was like, cool, right? The this is great. I, the cookie I, I, diet. <laughs> the cookie diet, right? So one, I'm getting paid to eat cookies. Two, I'm losing weight through the radio station where I thought I could only be big Chuck to be on the air. Okay, so, so like, maybe now is, you had permission to try to change your lifestyle. 100%. And so I'm all in, right? The first thing people need to know about the cookie diet is the cookies, they do not taste like cookies, right? They taste like rancid garbage. I can't say what I want to say, but they just don't <laughs> taste very good, right? So if they're and, not actually sweet cookies. My God, no, the furthest thing from it, right? The best analogy I can make is go eat the sponge that's on your kitchen sink, maybe sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon on top and, and have a raisin with it, right? That's and awful. that is the cookie. It is God awful, right? But you had to eat one for breakfast and you had to eat one for lunch and drink a whole lot of water with them. And that's supposed to carry you over to dinner where you eat this ambiguously defined sensible dinner. They don't tell you what a sensible dinner is. They just say, make sure there are some vegetables on your plate. Now, I want to be a good boy. I'm getting paid well to do this. I certainly want to lose weight because I had just come off of this relationship where I felt like garbage. And so the first day I'm all in and I'm doing pretty good, right? I'm thinking a little bit about the food that I miss, but I'm so motivated. I'm so excited that the first day, more or less, I'm okay. Day two, without Taco Bell in my life, I really start to fixate on this, right? I want my seven layer burritos. I want my grilled stuff burritos, my quesadillas, my caramel empanada. I want them starting to feel burrito. withdrawal. Very much so. That's, my mind was just focused on that. And I started to get a little bit cranky. And then 
it was weird because I also felt like I was coming down with like a cold. And so I was just like, all right, really, really, really want Taco Bell, but I can't do it because I'm doing the cookie diet. Day three comes and it is a nightmare. By this point, my obsession with Taco Bell was full throttle, like five alarm, flashing red lights. Like this is all my brain could, could focus on was Taco Bell. I needed to get my Taco Bell. What was I going to do? Because I'm supposed to be doing this thing called the cookie diet, right? So I am freaking out. And because I'm freaking out and that's all I can fixate on, I am the most irritable SOB in the history of people. If you would have said, hi, Chuck, it's a beautiful day. I'm so glad you're in my life. I would have said, get out of my face, like right now. I was that irritable, that angry. Don't talk to me, just stay clear. And, and then I remember getting off of work that day and just a little bit of a cold had become like a full-blown flu. And I was in bed and I was just, just so seething angry and so sick. And all I could think about still was getting to the drive through If I could just get to the drive through everything would be better. But I can't do it because I'm doing the cookie diet. So eventually, I just explode. And I hop up out of bed. And I, boom, I put my fist through a wall. That's going to calm me down. It didn't. So what did I do? I, boom, I put my fist through the door next to the wall. And that still didn't call me down. And I'm freaking out. What am I going to do? So I devised this plan to go to Taco Bell in the middle of the night, 24-hour drive through I would sneak out of the house. Nobody would be any the wiser. Everybody would think that I was still doing good on the cookie diet. And I would just make up for it by spending like two and a half, three hours at the gym the next day. And that is exactly what happened. For the next couple of months, Every single night I would go to Taco Bell and every single day I would be at the gym burning it off. And the weight loss that I sustained or, or experienced because I was working out so heavily at the gym, I attributed all of that to the cookie diet. And so I just remember though, Dr. Agarwal, that first night back with that Taco Bell, that first bite of that seven layer burrito and having this ridiculous epiphany because when I bit into that, it was like this warm rush, this calm just washed over me like it was a tsunami. And suddenly everything was okay. I, my brain calmed down instantaneously hmm. and I wasn't angry anymore. I wasn't sad anymore. I wasn't freaking out anymore. I was myself again. But then very shortly thereafter, that was followed by enormous sorrow because I realized that I was hooked on this. I was hooked on it just like it was a drug. And I had quit smoking. And that was so much easier than quitting Taco Bell. Taco Bell was going to be the death of me. I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew that I wanted to do something, but I wasn't ready to do it because what was I going to do if I took it out of my life again? I'm going to be right back on that Jekyll and Hyde situation. Didn't want to do that. So I'm pretty well stuck. Epiphany, that revelation not only told me that I was hooked on this, but it told me that quite literally it was going to be the death of me. And so from that epiphany, it was still years until was going to do anything about it until I reached that breaking point. And, and it was just knowing every single time I went through the drive through what the ramifications were, that I was going to need more blood pressure medication, that I was headed toward an early grave. I still couldn't control myself. I still went through the drive through every single day. And so I had that big epiphany and I was still lost. It's so, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, you're, you describe how the food just gave you this sense of peace almost, you know, and so, you know, you're, you're agitated, you're so frustrated, you're feeling signs of withdrawal, you, you can't think of anything but the food, and then you eat and you're like, ah. but then there's the guilt that comes sort of after eating or doing a drug or whatever it is that, and you, you suffered from sort of all of those things. 
So what was it that made you finally decide that this enough is enough? You know, how, and how did you work through that feeling that was bound to come again? And how does anybody go through that? You know, there's, we all have our things that we like um, before we go to bed or our peaceful things that calm us. And how do you work through or find other things to calm you? I, I didn't know, man. <laughs> At that point, I, I, I just didn't know. And what I knew was I could no longer hide just what an immense struggle I was in because once the cookie diet endorsement ran its course, I of course stopped eating that and started eating that Boston market, that 7-Eleven again. And in addition to the pizza and the Taco Bell, and I just ballooned, got heavier than I ever had been in my life. And my friends tried to organize an intervention for me. Again, let's draw those parallels between drugs and food addiction, right? They tried to organize an intervention for me to voice their concern about my weight. You want to talk about humiliating. This was almost worse than the flight of shame where I couldn't fit into the seat. And so I remember being tipped off to this and reading my friend who just wanted to help me. I read this guy, The Riot Act up one side and down the other. And this was the same guy who gave me my big break in radio, right? I owed this guy so much, but I cut him out of my life because he was trying to cut this food out of my life. Right. That's the way I viewed it. It's such a sensitive topic, time. sure. Hugely. And then all of my other friends who he had invited to come to this thing, cut them out of my life for a number of years as well. And so finally, I get to a point where I can't even walk 10 feet without my chest beginning to tighten. Yeah, you, you hear this analogy about it feels like an elephant is sitting on my chest. That is so accurate. And imagine that happening to you, knowing the history of heart disease that you have in your family, and then only being in your mid 20s, right? You finally realize, like, holy crap, I'm not going to live to see 30 years old. And so that really, I think above anything else, the biggest factor in wanting to make these changes in that wake up call that finally said, hey, yeah, I'm ready. But I didn't know what the heck I was going to do still. All I knew was you were scared enough. Oh, my God. Yeah. You were scared enough that Terrible. it jostled a like desire to finally, OK, I got to do something survival instinct kicked in, no doubt about it. And survival so instinct. I did it. That's interesting. I, I didn't know anything about healthy eating, obviously. Remember, the extent of my nutrition knowledge at that point was the cookie diet and that ambiguous, sensible dinner. And so I just remember being desperate and my father had had weight loss surgery. My friends had had weight loss surgery. I had known some other people who had had it and saw their initial success and in how much weight they had lost initially. And I want to emphasize initially because over time, just like any other diet that they had been on, they gained the weight back. And in many cases gained all of it back and then some, right? But I thought that this was the best option that I have right now so that I could reach 30 years old. But then go to my grave, I'm, I'm 40, thinking full well, I would have regained all of the weight and then some. I could go to my grave saying, well, at least I tried everything. And so that is what brought me to the decision to have gastric bypass surgery. And so I did. But luckily- I And mean, did you have the I'm, sleeve or- what did you no, have? No, 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 Ruin Y, Ruin Y. So oh, you, like, had the, kinda, you had the, the original. Cadillac. Yeah. Yeah. The Cadillac, the OG of weight loss surgeries. And so I just remember waking up and being in such excruciating pain. And then thinking back to that night with the Taco Bell where I had that epiphany. And so suddenly, as I woke up from this procedure, all of fast food, uh, dinners and 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 even the logos like the golden arches became the enemy right i remember waking up um the day that i was released i had gone home i was taking a nap i woke up and there was just a cup of black coffee from mcdonald's and seeing that that my father and my mother-in-law had kindly brought me 
Um, and I just remember seeing the golden arches and I just got pissed, right? Well, like why? I was, why did that, why did because that make it you represented, angry? it represented everything that had put me in that place to begin with. It was why I was there. McDonald's had put me there. Taco Bell had put me there, right? All of those pork and beans, the potato chips, the cream corn, the half of a chicken, the pizza, all of that had put me there. And I saw all of that in that McDonald's logo. And so even though there was a largely calorie-less black coffee in that cup, I wanted to take that damn cup and throw it across the room. Like, don't put that stuff in front of me. And so from that day, I have never been through a drive through to get anything to eat. You know, the closest I've come is I've been in the car with somebody who goes through and like, that's uncomfortable for me, to be perfectly honest with you. But, you know, I, I get through and I, I don't place an order for myself. But, you know, I, I just kind of seized on that anger and have used it now for 13 years to further my nutrition knowledge. And, you know, it was still many years after that, even that I stumbled across the idea of eating a plant based diet, because until that time. I still thought that I was going to put all the weight back on because that was every single example that I had seen until then. So why would I be any different? Okay, so you decide to go through a row and why, and just just for everyone listening, a row and why is a is an is an intensive abdominal surgery that requires cutting open the abdomen and um, actually stapling or sealing off part of the stomach and making the stomach instead of being a normal size to uh, shrinking it down. So people, people who go through this procedure actually have a stomach that's the size of a golf ball. <clears throat> so, and then, um, and so the, the reason, so when you first start um, eating after gastric bypass, you can eat so little like uh, a quarter piece of a cheeseburger, that uh, a few, you know, French fries, that kind of thing. And then what happens is over time, the reason people gain weight again is because the stomach is very stretchable. It's like a rubber band and you can stretch it back out again. So as you continue to eat, if you continue, you can continue to stretch it, stretch it, stretch it. And then over time, people can gain the weight. So it's a huge surgery to go through. And then to gain that weight again is extremely frustrating and um, to patients, um, to have to go through, but you kind of accepted that you felt like, you know what, I've, I've had the, um, I'm going to get the quick jump start. I'm going to get this procedure done. And, but you know, and I'm going to enjoy the weight loss that I had, but I'm just going to gain it back. And you've kind of mm. had accepted that. Yeah, no question about it. Um, and, and I don't want anybody out there. I know that there is a large contingent of people who feel like weight loss surgery is kind of the easy way out. Um, there ain't a daggone thing easy about it. Like yeah, I'm agreed. dead serious when I tell you, like there is nothing simple about what a person goes through after this. Right. And yes, you also absolutely. need to realize that, that the person who is in that position is probably feeling a lot like what I did desperate out of options, just trying to live to see tomorrow. And yeah. So I think that's, a, not... I'm glad you said that. I'm, I'm really glad you said that because I do think people look at maybe you or other people who believe, you know, who have trimmed down and say, well, you just trimmed down because you had weight loss surgery. And I absolutely agree with you that, uh, that you were at the point in your life where you needed a sort of a jump start, And it does get to a point in some illnesses that if you don't make an aggressive, drastic change, sometimes you need something drastic to, to change you. Uh, and I respect that. And I respect that you were able to make that decision. And, uh, but I do think there is a lot of judgment about from people to say, well, you, you know, you went through this, that that's how, why you, you took the easy way out. And I absolutely agree with you that weight loss surgery is not the easy way out. And there's so much prep that goes into actually going through that, the emotional games that not even games, the emotional process that you have to go through to decide that you have to go through the surgery. And then the surgery itself is extremely intensive. Now there are options and more available now, like sleeves that are more, uh, less involved and intensive, but they certainly are still intensive. And the person that decides to go through this procedure has to go through a lot emotionally. And I don't think anybody should ever call a ga why, um, gastric bypass surgery um, the easy way out. No, no. I mean, they, there's so many tests, psychological tests, sleep tests, and you learn so much about your health. 
um, before you even do it. But but here here's kind of the alarming thing, though. What I didn't know before this also was that if the first surgery, you gain all the weight back, they tell you don't worry about it. You can come back for a revision That's surgery terrible. where we staple your stomach the second time. So what the doctors don't realize, the majority of them, and I don't, I'm not one of those people that feel like every doctor is you know, just prescribing surgeries because they're greedy and they want that money, right? Not the case. They just don't understand that when they tell somebody that they can do this a second time, what they're saying is go ahead and keep eating the way that you were, right? Because that is how the mind of somebody who is super morbidly obese will interpret that, right? Yeah. And so that's why, you know, we were talking at the beginning of the interview about people saying, well, when can I eat this again? And this is like, well, you can eat it a lot sooner and you don't have to give it up for another few years, right? And people are like, cool, right? But then also the scary part is, although you have a doctor who is really working to make you healthy, rerouting, literally rerouting your intestine and you're working with a nutritionist and you're working with a trainer, like it's a whole group that's really trying to work with you here. There is still this major disconnect when it comes to food addiction because when I reached what the doctor had said was my target weight, I believe it was like 175, maybe 170 or 180 at that point, somewhere in that ballpark, said that that was my target weight. At that point, I'm still five feet five inches tall, so I'm still in the obese range, right? But then the doctor one day is like, you've done such a great job. You're the model patient. Now you need to eat a hamburger you need to eat a hamburger. This was the advice that I was given by my surgeon. Wow. And I just, I remember thinking back to that night with the Taco Bell and that epiphany, that awakening. And then when he told me this, I was like, that is literally the crummiest advice I have ever been given by a doctor or anyone else. And there is a huge disconnect. And so I just, I was very grateful to this guy to put me in this position where I had lost all of the weight. But at the same time, I was furious because you were putting crack back in the palm of a crack addict. Say, yeah. hey, you've done so good. You've been sober for a year. Light up, buddy. That must have been so hard to hear. Amazing. Yeah, well, I never ate the hamburger because, and, 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 and I think that I would have had I not experienced what I did that night with the Taco Bell years earlier, right? So if I had not known the extent of my addiction to food, I would have thought I could have handled that hamburger. But I look at those foods to this day, very much like drugs, right? I know that an alcoholic doesn't celebrate sobriety with a beer. I know that a crack addict doesn't celebrate sobriety with crack. I know that a smoker doesn't celebrate a year of being off of cigarettes by lighting up. So, so why is it, is it like, like that to this day? I mean, does it still feel like you actually couldn't, like, do you crave any of those foods or, and then worry that if you went towards them, that no, 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 it would be a slippery slope? Like, how does it feel? The cravings are fleeting at this point, but I do still very much worry that if I don't, or if I were to give in, eat one of those, it would be a slippery slope because like literally every other diet that I had in my life before the cookie diet, I can, I can think back to that one instance where I rewarded myself by eating, uh, you know, a slice of cake or uh, one nacho. My one nacho theory is you can't have just one nacho. It, it sends you off the rails, right? I had lost 70 pounds, doing great. Thought I could have one nacho. And one nacho led to a second and a third. And the next thing you know, I'm right back at Taco Bell and boom, my waist expands. So if I've done that so many times in my life, even though that's many years ago at this point, why would today be any different, right? So I just don't even tempt fate and I don't have cheat days, right? So that's very, very, very important because I think that even though I may have changed a lot physically, I think that there's still a big part of my brain that would love nothing more than to celebrate with a whole bunch of dopamine release from a seven layer burrito at Taco Bell. But see, I think that that's really important thing that you just said, because I think that there is, people often wonder how you, um, how you stick with things, right? And, you know, people often ask me, for instance, with my rheumatoid arthritis, why, you know, how do I handle it? Or how do I um, not break down and eat X, Y, or Z? 
And it's, I think it's the same thing that you're describing, which is that, you know, when you've been so sick and you know what it feels like to be in that place of darkness, uh, you never want to go back and you never want to even come close. So for me, it's not worth it. Like I will never go back because I never want to feel I, I never want to feel sick that way. And so I will do whatever I have to do to stay healthy and to feel good. And I get it. So I, I get it more than probably most people that you will never go back to eating those foods because you never want to go back to any place that will bring you into that darkness. So I totally get that. Uh, you know, I know we've been chatting for a while and I, I would love to just finish by asking you, so how did it come to plants? Like, how did you move? Because most patients who go through gastric bypass will eat the same foods they normally eat uh, and just eat them in much smaller portions, right? And so they'll still eat a hamburger and fries or they'll still eat a lot of the same foods and maybe a little healthier, but a lot of people, as you pointed out, because they gain so much weight back, they often will just eat the same foods again. So why did you change to eating plant-based? Well, what made you do that? Things happen. Uh, number one, um, I, I went to my high school reunion, my 10 year high school reunion, and uh, wound up, it turned out the girl who I had a huge crush on in high school had been tracking my weight loss. She had become a real big nutrition nerd. Oh, so you were, you were and, posting it and you were on in social media. Oh, very much. Following. I, was, I was banging that drum for weight loss, right? And so she, like I walk into the reunion and I hear Chuck Carroll, you know, and, and there she is. Like she's calling my name and we just, we hit it off and we start dating and she's schooling me up on um, a healthier Way of eating. She definitely was not plant-based, but she was definitely um, a step in a much healthier direction. So that was, that was kind of the jumping point. But sure. then by luck with CBS, I interviewed a professional wrestler of all things by the name of Austin Aries, who had just written a book about how, despite the fact he was eating a plant-based diet in the most macho meat eating uh, kind of uh, environment that you could think of, he was still able to excel all the way to the top of his craft, you know, even going so far as to wrestle at WrestleMania. And so he's like, I know that they call you the weight loss champion. I know that you have a keen interest in nutrition. You should really look at eating a plant-based diet. And he gave me a list of things to watch and a couple of things to read in addition to his book. And I just went down that rabbit hole. Mm. And then the more I learned the more the idea and the fear of reverting back to my old ways began to fade away because I was like, oh my God, this is what I've been missing my entire life. And, and so suddenly my weight loss journey wasn't just about losing weight. It was about keeping it off, but then also, you know, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, all of these other conditions, heart disease, like we were talking about all of that. Like it all clicked for you. Right. It all runs in my family. And I'm like, oh my God. So not only can I be slimmer, but I don't have to worry so much about all of these other conditions as well. And that was just like, thank you, God, for this moment. Thank you for this interview. Because that, like Austin, that conversation I have with them, that was really, I think, what set the table for you and I even to be talking today. There would be no exam room had it not been for that interview. Isn't that interesting? You know, I, I, you know, somebody gave me advice once, um, and I, I think about it all the time. And you know, they they it's about the road, right? It's about the road. And if you start on the road and you try to figure out what the rest of the road looks like, I've said this to my husband a hundred times. I just wish they knew what the road looked like, you know. And I and then I would know what to do, you know. And so, but the irony, of course, is that doesn't make any sense at all, and that. You can never know what the road looks like. You just have to know what the piece looks like in front of you and then focus on that piece and that you just keep going on piece by piece. And, and here you are now, you know, doing something probably that's the antithesis of the, of the person you were when you were, you know, 15 years old. And I think that that's just amazing. And so bravo to you. What would you say to people who are struggling with their weight and, food addiction, or maybe not even food addiction, but just love to eat or, you know, don't have this word food addiction in their vocab, or they don't identify with that. But what would you say to people to say, like how to motivate change um, in somebody who's struggling with their weight? I think, you know, 
I'm not sure that there's much that you could do to really motivate a person to make such drastic change in their life, right? The person needs to reach rock bottom, right? So if we, uh, if we are talking specifically here about food addiction, not just weight loss, right? Because it's an addiction, the person needs to reach rock bottom and only they will know what rock bottom is, right? So think about the interventions, the flights of shame, the girlfriend that hit me, all of that stuff, um, other people trying to talk to me, you know, none of that worked. It, it was all about when I was ready to do it, right? So when that person reaches it, they will know. But what they need to know when they reach rock bottom is now it's time to start climbing out and you can make it to the other side. You absolutely can make it to the other side, right? You just have to rethink some things, right? It's not about the biggest word of comfort that I can give to people is, is one, you don't have to be Superman or Superwoman to do this. You already have everything it takes. But two, we're not asking you to break up with food. We're just asking you to eat healthier versions of the food that you have been eating. And those versions do exist. And so you can keep eating burritos if that's your jam and have the most extraordinary, flavorful, wonderful burritos that blow anything that Taco Bell has on their menu <laughs> way out of the water. And it's, you're gonna have so much less fat and so many fewer calories and so many more nutrients that it's, it's gonna be almost impossible if you continue down that path to revert back to the way that you were. Like you almost have to work hard to go back to where you were. As long as you don't reintroduce that kind of food, you're set. You are literally set and it can be that easy. I know it's built up in your mind to be something that is incredibly complex and God knows it can be, but you can really simplify it as well. And once you do and you believe in that path and, and, and you find that it can work, man, it is some sweet living. It is some real sweet living. I think that's, I think that's great. I, I've heard this before in the addiction um, world is that almost that we can't, we can't, the person, it has to come from inside that the person has to sort of get to the bottom and then build back up. And I think as, as family or as friends, um, I think that all we can do is be supportive, give, give out, give information to the person, try to motivate them, but also then, but not to expect, I think that's the key is not to be disappointed when things don't um, happen exactly the way, like, wait, I gave him all this information and he didn't change. Well, it takes time and that person has to come to it on their own. And I do think that, as you pointed out, there were multiple different things that had to happen for you to make the change. And, um, and just to sort of honor the process, I think as family and as friends is to honor the process, but to also, you know, continue to support that person and to give them support. Also, um, judgment is the other thing that comes from this is that, being careful about our judgments and to sort of remember that when we see the person on the airplane who's really obese to not have those eyes and to not say, oh, thank God, I'm not sitting next to, um, because, you know, we haven't walked in that person's shoes and we haven't uh, experienced what you've experienced or, you know, um, we didn't maybe grow up the same way. Um, you know, it's easy to say that you should eat better, but when you're four five and six years old and you're eating, drinking soda and hamburgers and French fries every day, um, and that's how your palate was started, it's hard to understand why that person doesn't like spinach or kale. And it's just important for us to remember as people that people start differently. Um, and all of that plays a role in sort of their course. And uh, it takes time and that we just have to sort of embrace people and honor the process. Well said, well said, you know, you're, you're so right about the seeds, you know, being planted at such a young age. I mean, like Popeye could have talked till he was blue in the face about the benefits of eating spinach, uh, but I wasn't ready to hear it because spinach to me was nowhere near as good as the Frankenberry or Count Chocula cereal that I was eating while watching his cartoon. So right. um, yeah, and, and just have some compassion, but I, I will leave with this and maybe we can do a follow-up episode, not yeah. to put you on the spot about yeah. this, is that with so many people now struggling with their weight, um, people, who are having the same struggle as, as I did, more and more and more of those people exist. And so my concern is 
as that kind of stigma that's associated with that is erased, and I'm glad that there isn't any because nobody should be made to feel less than, but as that becomes more normalized, I think that can also be to the detriment of our own health. And so that then is another slippery slope. You know, how do you not get the wool pulled over your eyes there? That's a, that's a complex conversation. Yes, that is. A, that's an interesting comment too, as we sort of make it more acceptable with vanity sizing and um, making it okay to be size 14 and above or uh, embracing your body as an obese person and uh, all, all important to do for confidence and um, self-love. But you're right, um, does bring us into a place where unhealthy habits are supported. Um, and then high, you know, unhealthy illnesses um, are, of course, the result. Mm, that's interesting. No, I'd love to. I'd love to have you back, Chuck. You're so fabulous. It, it, I find the um, conversation just um, interesting, and but also so. I think there's so much hope in what you've talked about, and that's the whole point of this, which is to remind people that uh, everybody struggles, and there's bad stuff that happens to all of us. All of us. Uh, no one is uh, immune to that. And that, you know, uh, it's not sort of, as I tell my kids, it's not how you fall, but it's how you get back up. Um, and um, you have a beautiful story of getting back up and look at you today. So thank you so much for being here with me and spending the time. And I'm hoping that your story becomes a source of motivation for people to just make a few steps. Everything doesn't have to happen in one day. Uh, small things can happen. Change is hard, but uh, change is good. So no question so about it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Chuck.